Okay, good morning. We've checked in. We've prayed. We're ready to go. Welcome to Cascadia Church. We are continuing in our series on Route 66, uh, 66 books in the Bible. Today we're on... Now, I, I had a little chat with a 49ers fan this morning. Uh, we are, we are, now, I don't know if this is a sign or not, but we're in book 49. I don't know. Uh, some take that as a, as a sign. Uh, I don't know. Well, since 49 means something to other people as well, but uh, regardless, here we are. We're prayed up. We're ready to go. Congrats to the 49ers. And uh, what a game. Wow. As the Seahawks often say, well, there's always next year, right? <laughs> Saying it again. <laughs> All right. Hey, let's get started. Uh, Sometimes when I think about the church, and that's what the book of Ephesians is all about. It's about the church, the body of Christ. Uh, I, I think back to my own spiritual journey. I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church and then came to know Christ as my Savior when I was a senior in high school. And uh, my life changed in a lot of ways in terms of what I was looking for and what I was needing in a church. Our family, the Lloyd family at that time, in about a span of two years, all six of us came to know Christ as our Savior. And friends of ours from Ketchikan, Alaska, helped us to find a good, solid Bible teaching church. That's where I met Joanne and all sorts of other things. It's Cornerstone Church, uh, if some of you know about our friendship and relationship with Cornerstone Church. Well, my mother, you know how she is. She's watching today. Uh, she would send out Christmas cards. She still does with letters and updates on how things are going with the Lloyds and so forth. And in one of those letters she sent out, she'd mention the spiritual transformation that's happening inside the Lloyd family and how we'd found another church to be attending and so forth. And I would read some of the cards we'd get from friends, and I will never forget one person, I don't remember who she is, but I know it was a lady. Uh, her response was, I can understand people leaving the faith, but I can never understand people leaving the church. And I didn't know much. I was just a brand new Christian, but I thought, something about that doesn't sound right. You know, leave the faith, but not leave the church. And in her tradition, uh, the church is the faith. And you can be a non-practicing member of that particular church, even if you're irreligious. And that's what matters. It should belong to that particular denomination. And that's the best I can make out of all that. So it, it kind of helps us to lead into what we're looking at today in the book of Ephesians. And one of the questions that's answered in this book is, what is the church? What does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to be in the faith? And I'm going to provide a quick preview of the book of Ephesians for us. And then we're going to jump into this and take a look at what we've got. So let's begin with this as we typically do here in Route 66. Uh, a summary of each book in 10 words or less, and so for Ephesians, we're going to go with this. Christians, those who know Christ, are all members of Jesus' body, the church. Now, the church is referred to in a bunch of different ways. It's called a building, it's called a bride, and so forth. But in the book of Ephesians, it's called a body, the same in First and Second Corinthians, because we are members, and we make up this organization, this organism, actually, called a church. So that's what this uh, little summary here is about. The theme of Ephesians is the body of Christ. The body of Christ, which is the church. A key verse for us today, chapter 3, verse 21. To him, to God, be the glory in the church. Now, for God to be given glory, or for us to glorify God, means we reveal who he is. We show who he is. And the church is designed, was created by Jesus so that God would be glorified. God would be seen and known, known here on earth and ultimately so that his son Jesus would be glorified. Jesus would be revealed and Jesus would be honored. Now a little cartoon for today from our friends at Walk Through the Bible Ministries. What do you see? I see an efficient. E-fishing, Ephesians. You're not getting it, are you? No, is it that bad? No, it's, you get it? Okay, that's E-fishing, Ephesians. You see the E? He's fishing. And he got a bodybuilder. 
So Ephesians is about building up the body. Oh, wow. See, these little things start coming together like that. All right. All right, I heard the groans. I don't hear any cheers. I just hear groans. Let's move on. Item number one, we're going to build this acrostic church today. So number one is this, Christ gave his life to redeem mine. Jesus gave his life to redeem my life and yours and every life for those who say yes to him. Ephesians 1, verses 7 and 8 read this way. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. So we're going to see here that the church is the family of God. It's the body of Christ. And the key to the church, the only way you can get into the church or become a member of the church or to be a Christian, which is the same thing, uh, is to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. So redemption is is a super important word, not only in Ephesians, but all across the scriptures. So we're going to come back to this idea of redemption in a minute. Uh, but let's take a look at this as well. Chapter, um, <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. God put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we see in these uh, couple of verses here that the church is the body of Christ. And Christ, who fills all things, has filled the church with himself. That's what this verse, these two verses, are pointing to. This idea that Christ is a creator and sustainer of all things, and the way that Jesus manifests himself The way that Jesus is on earth today is not through a single person, but through the collective of all of those who know him. And we are called his body, his physical presence here on earth. So uh, the church, this is is something we can spend a little bit of time thinking about and talking about. The church is the fullness of Jesus. Everything that Jesus is on earth is the church. And that's why God makes such a big deal about the church being pure and being correct and making a difference in the world. It's a humbling thought. So the church is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, What do we mean by church? There are two different ways uh, to which the scriptures refer to this idea of the church. The first one, we have, as humans, have capitalized the word church, to make a distinction between the two. The church, spelled with a capital C, is the universal church. These are all the people who at any time have ever put their faith or trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. Those who lived before us and are now in heaven, and those who are alive here on earth now who know Jesus, and even those who are yet to be born who will someday put their faith in Jesus Christ. All of us collectively, on earth and in heaven, are the universal church. We also spell the word church with the small c, and that refers to a local church. Cascadia Church is a local church, which means the bigger, broader, massive body of Christ, one of the locations where he is manifested is among us here. So uh, way back when I was in college and seminary, I uh, ran a Bible study correspondence course for our church in California, big church. We had 17 full-time pastors. Uh, We had a thousand people around the world enrolled in this online Bible study or this correspondence Bible, Bible study correspondence course that correlated with the radio broadcast we had at the time. And so my responsibility was to handle the correspondence that came into the radio station, radio broadcast. And one, one person wrote and said, you know, the, the closest good Bible teaching church I can find is 50 miles from my house. Even though it's so far away, is it still local? I said, so when I wrote back, I said, 
local doesn't refer to geographical locality near your house. It just means that it's a smaller subset of the bigger group, local versus universal. So uh, the idea here, whether it's the universal church or the local church, every person who is a member has been redeemed by Jesus Christ. That's really the only biblical qualification for church membership, at least with the capital C, is that you know Christ as your Savior, that you have been redeemed. And redemption means that a price was paid for your forgiveness, for your spiritual freedom that we looked at last week. And so uh, we read here in Acts chapter 20, 28, in fact, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the leaders at the church in Ephesus, to the Ephesian church. And he said this, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased or redeemed, with his own blood. So the church is made up only of people who have been redeemed. Now there we will have visitors, we'll have guests, and those kinds of things. But our aim, our goal, our purpose, our hope, our prayer is that uh, they too would be redeemed by Jesus Christ and be able to become a part of God's universal family and a part of this local assembly. Okay, Christ gave his life to redeem mine. Number two is this. Heaven is my ultimate home. Heaven is my ultimate home. That's what chapter 2 is about in Ephesians. The first chapter, he redeemed us. Second chapter, he's taken us home because we belong to him. Chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Even when we are dead in our wrongdoings, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we see the idea here of being made alive. And to understand what it means to be made alive, we have to first understand what it means to be dead. Well, we're all physically alive. He's not talking about physical life here. He's talking about spiritual life. I explained yesterday, I did a funeral service for a friend, and I explained to those who were present, there's two kinds of death, there's two kinds of life. And death is separation. Physical death is separation from the body. And when my friend Mary died, she left her body, but she remained alive. And she knows Jesus, and she's in heaven now. So she had this physical death, physical separation from her body. There was a point in time when she was spiritually dead, separated from God. But there was a point in time in her life when she said yes to Jesus, received him as her Savior, and she became spiritually alive. She established a relationship with God through faith in Christ. That's what this verse is about. And then because we have been given life, it is eternal. And it will never end. And we will always be with God in heaven. So the Apostle Paul is referring here to those who at one time were spiritually dead, spiritually separated from God, but have been brought to life and made right with God through faith in Christ. And he says here that he raised us up and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, we can't be seated in the heavenly places if we're living here on earth. So this is something that is yet to come for those of us who are still physically alive. Now, my friend Mary, she is at this location in heaven. We are not because we're still here on earth. So for those of us who are here and alive now on earth, positionally, we, are already, we already have a place reserved for us, and we can be as certain of heaven as if we are already there. So we have this confidence, this assurance in knowing even that the worst thing that could ever happen to us would be the best thing that could ever happen to us, because it only gets better forever. Number three, unlimited power has been given to me and to you. Chapter three, verse 20, 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So we see here that there's this power that works within us. Power to do what? Make a million dollars? A billion dollars? Power to be the king of the world? Power to gather a million YouTube subscribers? Power to win the Super Bowl? I don't know. It's not what these verses are about. These verses are about the, the, this idea that the Holy Spirit lives within us. And he has given us full capacity to fully put into practice everything that we need to do to be a strong and healthy and growing and thriving church. This book is about the church. And you're a member of it. And the Spirit of God gives you the capacity to do everything we have been instructed to do in the book of Ephesians. Now during Flock Talk, we're going to hand out, if you don't have it already, there's a little sheet that contains all the commandments in the book of Ephesians. These are all the things that God expects us to do as recorded in the book of Ephesians. And so we'll, <clears throat> we may talk about that a little bit during Flock Talk. Some of them may seem a little bit overwhelming, but what I want you to understand is this verse is saying that there's, there's spiritual power at work within us. And, and the Holy Spirit gives us the capacity to do this. God's never going to ask us or tell us to do something that we can't do without his help. So that's what that's about. Number four, renewal is the mark of my membership. How do I know that I'm really a Christian? How do I know that I'm really in the body of Christ? that I'm really a part of the family of God. Well, here's what chapter 4, verses 20 through 24 says. Rid yourselves of the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So to simplify this a little bit, look at this, what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. We're supposed to rid ourselves of the old self and put on the new self. Rid yourself of the old self, put on the new self. Now, every Christian, I'll just put it this way, has a spiritual split personality. We're, we're, we have two minds. We have the mind of Christ and then we have the mind that we were born with. And the mind that we were using up to and even beyond the time in our life when we came to know Christ as Savior. So there's the new mind, the mind of Christ. And there's the old mind filled with habits, filled with memories, filled with regrets that will haunt you. They haunt me. And those habits and memories and regrets will sometimes betray you. Sometimes they betray me as well. And all, all of that old mind stuff needs to be flushed out. It needs to be gone. We need to put on the new mind. How do we do that? But to be, we need to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. How do we do that? The key to living the Christian life as a member of the body of Christ is to live with a renewed mind. That's your mark of membership. That you want to think differently. You want to behave differently. You want to be like Jesus. But that's a battle. That's tough. That's not easy to do. That's why we have Ephesians to help us with that. So there is this struggle that we face in life. The scriptures teach that our spiritual enemy, Satan, he targets our minds. He wants to infect and influence the way that we think, knowing that if he can do that, he's going to influence the way that we behave. Here's a verse, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Same writer, the Apostle Paul, wrote, I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds, see that? Your minds 
will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So there is this general principle in the Bible that your thoughts control your behaviors. That's why we need to have a renewed mind. We need to be thinking new things, biblical things, Christ-like things. Here's a general principle in the Old Testament, Proverbs 23, 7. As he thinks within himself, so is he. Whereas a person thinks, in that way that person behaves. It's a general principle we find in the scriptures. So you're double-minded, I'm double-minded, you've got this split personality, I've got this split personality. We all do until we're in heaven and the old is gone and all, new, all things are new. And there is this battle in your mind over who's in control. Is it the old self or is it the new self? Is it you or is it Jesus? I had a conversation with a young lady about this yesterday. Who really is in control? Is it you or is it Jesus? And the one who wins that battle of control is the one that you feed. You feed the old self, and the old self's going to win those battles. You feed the new self, the new self, the new mind is going to win those battles. How do you do that? You feed your mind the word of God. If you, if you do that, watch the renewal. Watch the transformation that occurs in your life. I want you to think about this, if you would, please. Think about those you know who are making an impact for the kingdom of God. Their life is making a difference for eternity, for other people. One thing you will find in common for every single one of those persons is that every single day they're renewing their mind by reading the word of God. They don't skip a day. I have a friend who uh, got a PhD in family ministries and uh, the school that he went to was not a, it was a religious school, but not a Christian school. They had six different doctorates in the family. Family education, family ministry, those kinds of things, family therapy, whatever it might be. And Fred was telling me that he would be in class all day long going through his PhD program. Then he'd have to come home and spend just about as much time in the Word of God just to flush out the stuff that didn't belong there. So, renewing the mind Anybody whose life is focused is renewing their mind. Anybody whose life is fruitful is renewing their mind daily in the Word of God. That's the mark of your membership in the body of Christ. Number five, Christ alone is my role model. Chapter five is all about that. It begins this way. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now, a, a role model is a person either that you know or a person you're aware of uh, whose life is the one after whom you are patterning your life. He or she is an example, a picture of what you want your life to be like. Sometimes we call these people heroes or role models. Who's yours? Who's your hero? Who's your role model? Uh, my kids learned at an early age never to watch local news with dad um, because of my, my commentary that I would give during the news. And uh, whenever the weather would come on, on Channel 5, the kids would leave the room. <laughs> because a man would always finish his weather forecast by saying, if you're going to believe in somebody, believe in, anybody know what he said? Yourself. That's the worst advice anybody can give to any other human being. That is the worst advice. So my kids would often hear me shout, Jesus. Okay. Yeah. If you're going to believe in somebody, believe in Jesus. Some people will believe in sports heroes, rock stars. My grandkids are fascinated with YouTubers. 
They're, they're annoying. Not my grandkids, the YouTubers. <laughs> I tell them, stop already. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a YouTuber. Why? Because they're so cool. They'll grow up. They'll grow up. See this, the imitators of God. He ultimately is our role model. And Jesus said, if you want to see God, look at me. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is Jesus' role model. He is our role model. And the Apostle Paul was even able to say, follow my example even as I follow the example of Christ. Can you say that? Can you say to anybody, if you want to know what it looks like to look like Jesus, look at me. That should be where we can be living, and we can be living that way. If we realize that the Spirit of God gives us the capacity to live that way. None of us is perfect. We all fail. Model what failure looks like. People need to see that. Responsible failure, not irresponsible failure. Responsible failure means that you own it and you make things right. To model that to people that need to know how to handle their own mistakes. What I like about this verse is, are these words. Look at this. Beloved children, walk in love because Jesus loved us and he gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice. Those are powerful words just kind of condensed together in these two verses. And it reminds me of this phrase or this saying, maybe you've heard it before, that you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And if you genuinely love people, you will give of yourself to them. That's what Jesus did. And that's the example that we follow. Finally, number six, honoring others honors God. Honoring others honors God. Now, I'm gonna, I've, I've condensed verses one through nine <clears throat> uh, just to make this point here, to show you this pattern in chapter six. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Slaves or employees, looking at their cultural equivalent there, be obedient to those who are your masters or your boss. Masters or boss, do the same things to them. Serve them. Honor them. The point here that the apostle is making this first segment in chapter 6 is that there is a God-ordained order of authority in every human relationship without excuse, without exception. Every human relationship, every group, there's a God-ordained order of authority. And this is God's plan and God's pattern for humanity. And one of the ways that we show honor to God is we honor those he has placed in our lives in authority over us. Every single one of us has people who are in authority over us, without exception. If it's a marriage, if it's a family, if it's a church, if it's leadership within the church, if it's a workplace, if it's in the military, if it's in our schools or in our nation, we honor God by honoring those who are in authority over us. There is no exception anywhere. No excuse at any time. And we are also to honor one another, regardless of rank, regardless of role. Romans 12.10 says this, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in, see it? Honor. This is for every person in every relationship. We honor one another. Uh, it's not a popular idea in our culture to honor people to honor authority, God-ordained authority. Uh, it's not popular in our culture to show honor to people who vote differently than you do or believe differently than you do. There, there's so much dishonor and disrespect and contempt for anybody who's different. Here's why. There's a reason for this. 
part of the conversation we had with this, with this young person yesterday. Uh, we were talking about, you know, she's you know, young enough to be my daughter. Uh, so we're different generations. And she was asking, from your perspective, why are things the way they are in our culture? What in the world is going on? And to just give you the bottom line to the conversation, uh, we talked about how over thousands of years, the, the, the center of authority has shifted from God's word to science to you. It used to be that God's word was the authority. It used to be that science was authority. But now, who's the authority in all of life? You. And if you disagree with me, you must be punished because you're wrong. Regardless of the truth. Oh, wait a minute. There is no truth. This is my truth. Isn't that convenient? Boy, it's just crazy. Here at Cascadia Church, we believe what God says. God and his word are our authorities. And that means we are bucking the system. We're swimming upstream. We are countercultural. And it's not us who have changed. It is the culture that has changed. And we are called a salt and light to make a difference in our culture. And as long as we exist as a, as a body or we exist as individuals who know Jesus, my prayer is that we would remain focused, faithful, and fruitful. It's our calling. So to show contempt for those who disagree with you is so unlike Jesus. Think about this, and we're going to wrap it up here. Jesus came in the world knowing that most people would disagree with him. Knowing that most people would dishonor him. Knowing those who did disagree with him and those who did dishonor him would execute him. He knew that before he got here. He came anyway. And what did he do? He honored them. He chose to take their sins, those sins, with him to the cross to make possible for them what he's already made possible for you and me and what he has made a reality for you and me. Jesus took every sin to the cross to make possible the forgiveness of sins, to make possible a new kind of spiritual life, to make possible to become a part of the body of Christ, to make possible the idea that heaven is your ultimate eternal home. And so Jesus still is making that offer to every human being today. It's possible to have all these things. We meet Christ at the cross. We accept as true what he did for us and because of us. He becomes our savior and this life of transformation begins. And Ephesians is, is a handbook for how so much of that works. It's not exhaustive. But it's an excellent start. So that's the book of Ephesians. And uh, next week we're going to look into the book of Philippians. Let's take a moment uh, and just consider, first of all, uh, the takeaway for today. And then we're going to pray. Uh, here's the takeaway. I'm a part of his body. Ephesians 5.30. Just makes that just simple, profound statement. We are parts of his body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, preserving these words for us so that we would have them, we could read them, we can think about them, we can learn to put them into practice. Thank you for your spirit who lives within us, who gives us the power, the capacity to live this life. We can't do it without your help. We can't do it without divine instruction. And I think more and more, we need to tap into your power and receive what you have for us so that you will live through us as we live in this world, uh, attempting to shine our light and make a difference for Jesus to see the kingdom of God grow. Father, may that happen not only in this place, but in every church that makes up the body of Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say goodbye to our friends who are watching. Here we go. Thank you.